This way, please. The orientation is about to begin. Welcome, Gothamites, to another episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. With me, as always, the psychologist to these superheroes, superheroines, and supervillains of Gotham City, and now beyond, Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Hello, Andrea. Hi, Brian. It is 2020. 2020. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, we were down for the count in December. When you get sick, you get really sick. You were sick for a little over three weeks. And then, even though I tried and tried and tried, I, I tried for a solid couple of weeks. I then got sick. We were unable to record. Plus, we had the holidays. How were those holidays for you? It was very good. Um, actually, once I started to feel better, I was able to actually enjoy some of the holidays. And you were enjoying the holidays and doing some work because you you I were did, yeah. crazy busy during the last couple of weeks of December. I did. Yeah, I had um, right up to. I guess a week before, maybe a week before Christmas. And then throughout that week, there were a few projects I was working on, but um, anything you can tell us I, about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What can I talk about? So, uh, right around the release of the film rise of Skywalker, I had put out two articles about star Wars characters in particular, Ray and Kylo Ren. And, um, in fact, those two articles, although they are, what I would consider long form, the very sort of their chapters, uh, more, their yes. book chapters. Yeah, there are longer, long form articles about the psychology of each character. Uh, they don't address Rise of Skywalker. They're meant to be kind of leading up to that film. You so, hadn't seen it yet, and they came up. They came out yeah. before it. So if you've seen Rise of Skywalker, which, judging by the box office, a lot of people have, uh, you may find the articles to be really interesting because you really talk about sort of those characters before some big reveals. Yeah, there's a little bit of conjecturing and, and some projecting out like kind of what might happen or, or how they're leading up to certain, um, potentially certain outcomes, in particular with Ray, because there's a lot of, there was a lot of uncertainty about her history and, and her upbringing and where she's from. And of course, Rise of Skywalker determines that G gives a lot of uh, very very specifics on that um well let's just take a, a quick second i just want to ask spoiler alert if you've not seen the movie skip ahead let's say five minutes just real quick what were your thoughts i know you've got a star wars podcast lattes with leia but right tell our audience what you thought of rise of skywalker i only have five minutes can I link it? Well, I don't know why I'm asking for permission more time? on what to talk about. Uh, yeah, so I'm definitely asking for more time because I think now I'm stalling for about a minute. I would say that I, I enjoyed Rise of Skywalker immensely. It is jam-packed with so many character moments and reveals and um, satisfying fan service, uh, uh, compelling psychology um, closure to some some aspects of of the in, of the trilogy and then the entirety of the Star Wars saga. Having said that, it is not my favorite Star Wars film. There are some elements of the film that were disappointing, and in particular, when I examined Rey as a character and and wrote about her psychology, there were two things that I really wanted to highlight. One was her ability to use mindfulness, use a, a, a intentional practice to, uh, to gain awareness of herself, something that she actually learned from Luke Skywalker, uh, on the Island of Acto, she was able to learn more about herself and her abilities through self introspection and through the practice of, um, moments of meditation, um, acceptance of who she is and where she is. And 
patience right. and this idea, this notion that the force is not something that belongs to, to you, not something that you own, not something that you necessarily even can control, um, but something that you tune into really intentionally. And, and again, I, I really linked that to mindfulness and, and the, the benefits of mindfulness as a state of being that mm. actually helps us grow psychologically and helps us understand again our abilities, our um, our nature, uh, our own setbacks and failures, and a very it, it leads us to a very holistic sense of who we are, and actually that can lead to a lot of growth and development for us psychologically. And the second thing that I thought was important about her psychology was this aspect of her origin, this notion that in The Last Jedi, she perceived or she learns, she discovers that she is no one, she is from nowhere. And I wrote a lot about that concept of self-determination and the importance of that concept. Yeah. This idea that, um, you know, some kind of inheritance, genetics, legacy, history that, that, um, we don't have to rely on knowing that we don't have to rely on this dependence on where we came from to harness our abilities and, and to have value in society. And I sort of felt like, how I just thought it would be a really powerful story if she were to be actually she, yeah, from like, nowhere. Right. If she could embody that concept uh, of being an, an incredibly important figure in this universe, um, heroic in her own right. Um, she would have uh, the ability to own, she'd have ownership over her abilities. Um, and certainly these darker aspects of herself, the, the worries and fears about, these negative urges and this, this sort of interest in the dark side, that that was actually normal, that that was a, a part of her experience that she would learn to, to balance. You and I could, could have those equal experiences without having the last name Skywalker, Solo, or Palpatine. Yeah. And, and it turns out that that's not the case. Yeah, it turns out that, the, 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 of course, the film... In the film, The Rise of Skywalker, her her history is actually incredibly important. Um, now, I think it's still a compelling, powerful narrative that she still has to overcome that history and, and that trajectory. I, I think that's a fantastic story. Having said that, the article, of course, doesn't doesn't draw upon those aspects because that's the, 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 the article is, came out before the film. Okay, so then there's two articles... Pre Rise of Skywalker, there's Ray, there's Kylo Ren. Both of those are over at Fandom. You can also check out uh, our Facebook page, our Twitter. We certainly uh, put up the links to those things, um, and uh, and maybe we'll get a little more out of Drea about Rise of Skywalker a little further along in its box office run, uh, or you know soon sometimes soon some sometimes somewhere soon rise of skywalker isn't the only thing you were doing over the month of december you actually guest appeared on someone else's podcast this was so much fun so i actually got a chance to hang out with a um a professor at ucla um so we actually both have podcasts mine is about psychology and superheroes. Uh, Dr. Shane Campbell Statton is a professor at UCLA and uh, has this fantastic podcast about the biology of superheroes. So naturally, we mm. decided to get together and just talk about some of the um, some of those intersections, the the aspects of psychology and biology that go together. And of course, we immediately talked about stress. So our episode is up on uh, Dr. Shane's website. It's it's called the Biology of Superheroes podcast. Uh, I'm on episode 14 about the Incredible Hulk. And so we talk about how psychology uh, and the psychology of stress can shape our personalities, our characteristics, our behaviors, our decision making, and uh, what better character to talk about than Bruce Banner and uh, his alter ego, the Incredible Hulk. Nice. And it's a great episode. 
I highly recommend people check yeah, it out. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And thank you. I, I'm welcoming any new listener uh, or listeners who have uh, joined Found us. us yeah. yeah, who've joined us from the Biology of Superheroes podcast. Welcome. I hope that this is uh, just as engaging, educational, and uh, entertaining for you. Very cool. Um, what else have we got? What what else has gone on over the uh, the course? Oh, merch. I know it's weird, but the Arkham Sessions has merch, sort of. Uh, we opened up a T Public store, so if you want, you could head over to tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash the dash Arkham dash sessions. And you can find our store, which has uh, at the moment of uh, eight different uh, designs, including our logo. Uh, it's also got uh, some great art up there from Kian Tormi, who did our artwork that you see on the podcast now, probably wherever you're listening. Um, one that's, that's absolutely heartbreaking. It's basically just Mr. Freeze's hand holding the little snowy ballerina uh, snow globe uh, and it's called I failed you um, how could you <laughs> not only could I the moment we put it online I ordered one for myself and uh, I've worn it many times since uh, I got it uh, there's another good one of um, Harvey Dent Two-Face uh, one side is about as clean as you can possibly get it the other side very dirty not all the facial features are there uh it's pretty cool and it simply says harvey no it's a deep cut from btas <laughs> and uh and then we've also got um uh, Tom Zoller's original art that we had as an MZ exclusive and it was blue and white. This is full color and you can get it in just about as many colors as you could possibly want. It's a really cool shirt. Um, a lot of people have already been picking that up. And then we've got one that I designed that's just the Batmobile stuck in traffic. And it says the Batmobile, the worst idea Batman's ever had. Um, and uh, you can find that Again, at tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash the dash Arkham dash sessions. Um, go pick up some Arkham sessions shirts. And by the way, you don't have to get just shirts. You can get stickers, notebooks, mugs. Uh, mugs. You can get laptop uh, holders. And Slap wrist bracelets. I Slap, know, Slap I know, bracelets. I don't know if those are on there, but but if they are, you can find them there at tpublic. So go uh, check that out. Um, what else we got? Our dear friend, Livio Remondelli, created, or like wrote, uh, drew, and created this amazing comic book mm. called The Kit Lock. Um, I had known about this for, I want to say, over a year, maybe two years now, because uh, he, had, he had been developing this story. And um, I was really excited. Uh, not only did he he wrapped this up and um, it's, it's now being published uh, and released by IDW, but he asked me to write some profiles, uh, essentially psychological um, conceptualizations of each of the main characters. And those profiles will be in, uh, I believe starting issue three mm -hmm. of the kill lock. There's six issues total. So it's a complete um, sort of self-contained story. Yeah. And these are original characters, and I was so excited to um, to write about characters that I am just recently being introduced to. But the well, the interesting thing is they're robots. Yes, so you the fascinating, the fascinating part of this is that, um, of course, um, I'm I'm talking about psychology, but these are mechanical beings. These are essentially. Um, androids who have very similar psychological features. They're programmed to have um, certain actions, behaviors, emotions, inclinations, motivations like we do, but they are programmed just like robots are. Uh, and, and I find that so compelling because it gives us an opportunity to really kind of drill in and better understand how they behave and interact with each other and, and what kinds of things um, compel them to do one thing or another, how they're hurt by each other how they're um how they're connected and both, I, both, uh, metaphorically and, fig uh, and literally yes because in the kill lock the concept is that uh these are prisoners these mm -hmm. are 
criminals who have done something egregious, something, you know, socially unjust or unlawful. And the kill lock is this, um, this sort of, uh, program chain so that these four robots are connected with each other through this sort of remote programming. Should one of them die? Should one of them, uh, either intentionally or accidentally, um, pass on, then all four of them, uh, are, are dead. So it's this, um, really interesting concept where each of them has to kind of take care of each other in a sense of, you know, ensuring that each of them is alive. Um, they are uh, trying to keep each other alive, but they don't necessarily feel great about that. This was not their choice. They are in a punishment. And so their, uh, their journey to unlock themselves in particular, the, the four main characters of, of this story, their journey to find the cure of the kill lock uh, leads them to better understand what it means to um, be so connected to another mm-hmm. being and, and to think about kind of the longer term outcomes and repercussions. And so, um, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. It was like incredibly uh, just just kind of fascinating to be writing about these characters. And um, for anybody who you know, I can make so many comparisons. This is such a unique and well-written story. Uh, Livio has um, been in the Transformers world for a very long time. So he's a fantastic artist. Here, he's the writer. And it's um, not cartoony Transformers. Not I mean, he's he does dark, gritty Transformers that have lived on Cybertron and in Earth for hundreds of years. They're scratched up, they're beaten up, they're, they're torn down. And his art for the Kill Lock is very similar. But I would even say even more beautiful because there are sequences that take place in the snow and there are, uh, you get very dirty environments and worlds that you just wouldn't see in transformers. Uh, so I, I really, really like what he did with this comic. Yeah. I, if for folks who watched the Mandalorian, if you liked the narrative of IG 11, for instance, or even if you're a fan of C3PO and, and followed his journey, in Rise of Skywalker. Now you're just naming robots. I'm just just name dropping robots. But if, if those ideas are compelling to you, this concept of like, you know, where does the robot's life, I'm using air quotes, so where does it begin and end? How, how does a, a robot uh, embody an experience that's similar to a human experience? If those are the kinds of questions that you have, the kill lock is, is really going to meet those. Um, yeah. That, that kind of the thirst for uh, examining those concepts. And as a psychologist, I think it gives us an opportunity to um, to really be a little bit more unboundaried about that. Like to get, you mentioned the art was gritty. Um, the writing is intense. Yeah. It is a strong, heavy um, story with some, some pretty, uh, you know, there's some violence there, but I would say some, some pretty thought provoking ideas. And, um, and it really leaves you with a lot to think about. So, um, incredibly, incredibly well-written issue one came out over the holidays. Mm -hmm. I think issue two is going to be out maybe late January. So look for that on, in your comic book shop and on lines. Yeah. Do that. Um, Drea, let's, uh, let's move forward. We've got to, to talk about this episode of Doom Patrol. It's episode three. We're talking about Puppet Patrol. And you know, if we're talking about anything with the word puppet in the title, it's going to be one of my favorite episodes of anything. I love puppets. Maybe <laughs> Which as, is crazy. Maybe because, almost as much as you love robots. Mm, but, you know, you've, you've, had, uh, you've had those nightmares before, so... That's why I love puppets. Those were very specific ventriloquist dummies slash uh figures uh, i i don't uh no these are this well in this episode they are marionettes so we yeah. got we've got that going for us this episode finds our uh, group of heroes still looking for the chief they still don't know where calder is uh so they go looking for him they know they've got to get to paraguay uh, they, they sort of lean on cyborg 
the more accomplished hero, the more experienced hero of the group to get them there, thinking that he might have access to things, you know, that the Justice League might have, or, you know, that his father might have. Turns out, after he left his father behind, insisted on his own independence in episode two, that has come back to bite him in the butt because his father denies him the use of the bank account and the uh, private jet uh, he's got to do everything on his own. So the group decide to drive to Paraguay in what is kind of a, a comical uh, montage of, of the bus traveling down a map, circling around things. It was very Looney Tunes-esque. You know, they should mm-hmm. have taken a left at Albuquerque. It was... Uh, sorry, where? Albuquerque. Um, it, it, it is a very funny montage. I love this show. I love the sense of humor. Uh, and... Eventually, uh, Crazy Jane slash Flit is kind of fed up with all of this. And she touches um, uh, Robot Man, Cliff, and she touches uh, Larry. And the three of them go to Paraguay. They just they just show up in Paraguay. She has the ability to essentially uh, transport. Correct. Yeah. Herself and other people. She's not done it up to this point. Uh, well, and of course, as she points out, it's not Jane that's doing it. It's Flit. And we have not seen her before. Mm-hmm. We have not experienced her. Not everyone can do it. And frankly, she's just doing it because at this point, she's tired of it all. Um, and so she, uh, Larry and Cliff all go to Paraguay to find Von Fuchs's lab where, of course, um, we know that uh, uh, Eric Morden eventually went and became the, uh, the figure known as Mr. Nobody. The fi- figure, the, the incomplete figure, the, the broken the figure shadow. known as Mr. Nobody. Um, this, is the, this is both kind of like a historical uh, research lab there are some elements of it that clearly, I don't know, are um, run down, mm-hmm. but it's also the place where some pretty uh, supernatural things happen. But it's also like a spa. It's, it's literally weird. like a spa because you you basically choose your package, what it is you want. And of course, if we remember the experiment with Mr. Nobody, you get into a giant machine, he pulls down a, a lever and suddenly you are given some sort of supernatural ability. You've become a metahuman of some kind. And in fact, on their way to this lab, they do come across someone. Uh, his name is Steve. And uh, he desperately wants to be a metahuman. In fact, he has ordered a particular package, the one that he could afford. You said you wanted the Morden? What's that? I don't know but it's supposed to be freaking amazing. I mean, Mr. Nobody, right? But who has those kind of ducats? So, I'm getting magnet feet instead. Why? So I could walk up walls? Uh-huh. What's interesting is that the, the main characters of Doom Patrol have uh, asserted to us that, that their experiences with their supernatural abilities, the, the idea that they're superheroes is um, is a double-edged sword. That they, Sure, they might have some abilities that um, enable them to do some uh, imaginative and really sort of amazing things. But for the most part, their narrative is that these are burdens that becoming, I imagine coming to a spa where, you know, much like, um, where you might get plastic surgery or some, you know, quick couple hour procedure to improve yourself Yeah, that they see this as mocking them or they see this oh, as very possible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine it wasn't really addressed, um, directly, but I wonder if one of the undercurrents of this episode is, um, 
the this concept of superheroism has become almost like the celebrity status or this idea that Ooh. um some people were born into it or yeah. happened happened to be so lucky to get it and now it's become something that you can purchase there's a commodification of superheroism in fact the name of the spa is fooktopia fucktopia fooktopia spell yeah. it so i mean it's he he has created a Disneyland of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we should go ahead and say that there is a three hour long Jurassic Park esque intro, but it's not done through traditional animation the way that Hammond would do it at Jurassic Park. It's done through marionette puppets. And we get to see the history of Fooktopia and Von Fuchs and the fact that he was presented as this uh, hero, this geneticist, this scientist who had, had come up with this thing. And uh, we see Morden come in, in uh, through the, the puppets. And while Morden is going through the process of becoming Mr. Nobody, we actually get to see a little bit of the history where uh, our good chief shows up with a gun, starts shooting, and potentially that's what happened. I mean, mm -hmm. we, you know, Mr. Nobody may be a result of the machine not completing it uh, or completing its its work, or maybe that's just what they were giving Mr. Nobody as a, as a meta uh, ability. But, but we do know that that is where this whole... Yeah, the started. origins, it, it, something that I think is not so much an indirect undercurrent, but a very, um, I don't know, uh, something more explanatory, something that's a little bit more obvious, is this connection to um, the Nazi concept of uh, genocide. And, well, rather the other part of that, like how do we uh, use experiment and genetics and Which we actually talked about in episode one mm -hmm. with uh, On Leather Wings. We talked about... Way back. Way, way back five years ago, uh, we, we talked about the cross-pollination and the, mm -hmm. the different... It's like, how do we improve the human condition or the human body and um, make this sort of master um, existence mm -hmm. um, through through this experimentation and, and now through... Um, the commodification of supernatural superhuman abilities. So that part of it, I mean, it's sort of, um, it's really interesting that the show has been able to capture um, it really a lot of dark tones here, a lot of dark elements, and also still be quite campy and funny and um, kind of allow us into a space that's um, uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, one thing that I will note is we talked a little bit about Steve the gentleman who wanted magnetic feet. I don't know if this goes, you you weren't a big Doom Patrol fan. And I wouldn't necessarily say that I was a big Doom Patrol fan going into this show, but I certainly had read several issues. Are you aware of who Steve is no. in comic book lore? No, I am lore? not. Mm -mm. So the interesting thing is at the end of this episode, we learn that Steve uh, has been in the machine for a little too long. And he comes out with every possible incarnation of uh, organic uh, or even non-organic life attached to it, including plant life, rock, and of course, a giant second head that's a dinosaur. That's not an accident. He is literally Steve Larson, Stephen Larson, um, who would be Sven Larson from the comics, Dr. Sven Larson, who was uh, a former pupil of our own chief, who then got into a tiff with him and after an accident became animal, vegetable, oh. mineral man. Uh, of course, in the comics, he doesn't have two heads. Half of his head is a dinosaur head okay. and half of his head is human. And he's got vegetable. He has the ability to turn into any rock, any vegetable, any um, animal. And uh, and this is their little nod, I guess. It's more of a mutating ability, shape-shifting right. ability than right. what we saw. And he seems to love it. Although the dinosaur head is a little... Uh, aggressive. Aggressive. But um, 
Uh, I thought it was a fun nod to a character that is fairly well known in the Doom Patrol world of comics. Um, I'm eager to see if we see Steve come back or if that is the end of Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Um, but I thought I would point that out. I was very excited when he came out of the chamber and that is what he looked like. Uh, in fact, I got a little giddy and may have even jumped up and down. Um, but let's talk about someone else who crawls into the chamber for a minute. This is the guy I want to spend the majority of the show talking about because we've talked a little bit about Larry in the past. We've talked about how just how uh, really awful his life has been as he's been fighting with this double life, um, that of a, a gay man in uh, a military, a, 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 a long ago military. This is not a recent military uh, with the with even don't ask, don't tell. This is straight up the moment you say that you are gay in the military and I'm a, I'm a fighter pilot and I'm a test pilot, your career is over. Your life is done. Everything you love about this world is gone. Um, and uh, we've seen him be very antagonistic toward that energy being that's living inside of him that he received from the cosmos one day when he was flying a little too high in the stratosphere. And he has almost blamed his life on that being. But what's interesting is there's a moment where he goes into the chamber as if hoping that this would maybe cure him or separate the two beings that we, we no longer have to be together. Uh, and during this, the energy being basically gives him uh, a look at his past and we see that the energy being truly had nothing to do with how awful his life was. It, it was already awful. Um, we see that uh, he had this experience of bouncing from town to town to town with his wife and that he had always promised that things would be different, that he wouldn't go out with the guys after work as many times and and how it's always been the same and she is losing hope in their relationship and she is ready to go and he promises that it's going to be different there's a little bit of audio that i want to play here everything will be fine tomorrow I promise what about the day after that it will also be fine it's always the promise isn't it it's late. And you've got a big day tomorrow, I am well aware. I'm going to bed. Coming. You promised things would change after we moved here. You said there'd be no more late night beers with the guys. And I meant it. I right, just let me get through tomorrow. And you we'll... said the same thing when we moved to Ellsworth and Charleston. Why should here be any different? Because I'm telling you. Maybe this is all my fault. No. You haven't done anything wrong. I keep waiting for you to change. Maybe I'm the one who needs to make some changes. I'm really scared, Cheryl. I know it's not a very tough thing to say, but it's how I feel. I could die tomorrow. And the only thing keeping me from losing my mind is thinking about you and the kids. Hey. Come here. So, so here we see that he's making those hollow gestures to his wife, 
meanwhile, he has this lover on the side. And that person is telling him that he is ready to leave the military. He is not re-upping when his contract is up. He is going to go out into the private sector and live his life. And he encourages Larry to come with him. And Larry can't do that. And we see that same uh, emotional need to disconnect and jump away, you know, to protect himself. And uh, after the accident in the plane, when he is a burned, charred mess laying in bed, there is a very important moment where we see that his wife comes to visit him. Let's take a listen. Larry, it's Cheryl. Hey. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice, baby. Are you okay? How, how are the boys? Are they with you? No, I'm, I didn't bring them. I, <clears throat> I sent them to stay with my folks. Oh, that may, makes sense, I guess. It's better to keep them away from all this for now. I told them that Daddy had to go away for a while. And that he might not be coming back. Yeah. <laughs> Cheryl. Listen to me, whatever those doctors told you is bullshit. I'm gonna get better, and I'm gonna walk out of this place, okay? I promise you. Just hang on a little longer for me. I've been hanging on a long time now, Larry. I don't think I can do it anymore. Cheryl, please. I know things have been rough for a while. Just give me a chance to fix this, I swear to you. You can't. I love you, Larry, but you can't fix this. You can't fix any of this. You never could. I can change. We shouldn't be afraid to admit that we deserve better than this. Cheryl, please, please don't do this to me. I'm begging you. I'm sorry. I hope that you recover from this one day, Larry. And if that happens, I hope that you find the love that you deserve. I really do. Cheryl. 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 So this is her out and she takes it. This is the opportunity for her to go. Meanwhile, the man who was there all along that Larry desperately kept trying to separate himself from, the one who was going to leave the military, comes to visit with some of the guys. And this is what he says. Hey Larry, hey Larry, are you there, bud? It's John. Here with a few of the boys. We heard you were taking visitors, so we hopped in my truck and here we are. Looks like they got you in a real VIP suite here, trainer. You're the Sultan of I don't know what. Been a real thrill to hear your voice, Lair. <laughs> oh, hey, here's a laugh. Guess who re upped? That's right. Not going anywhere till the Air Force kicks me out. Yeah, I thought about the poor bastard who'd get assigned to you if I left. And just felt terrible for the guy. I think I'm the only one who knows how to deal with your bullshit trainer, so... Yeah, you're stuck with me. You hear me, buddy? I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here. Hey, Lair. Uh, I didn't read you, buddy. You want to run that back by me? Go. Come on. 
Copy that. Well, you must be all kinds of tired. I'm gonna let you get your rest. Be good, trainer. We're rooting for you. So Larry is the one who says go. This man was willing to stay. He was the one, you know, if we've talked about in previous episodes, the fact that Larry needed to choose and he didn't like the fact that he needed to choose. In this moment, he didn't even have to choose. One of them left him and the other one stayed. And this is haunting to Larry. And he blames it on the cosmic being inside of him. So I thought that this episode was especially deep when it came to Larry and his story. What did you think? I think this episode is all about control and that applies to nearly every single character that um, has, has further is further revealed is further examined um, Larry, especially because he he's he doesn't have it um he you you mentioned his attempts over and over to control his sexuality something that we don't choose right and so the amount of uh uh, his his sort of strong his conviction his delusion like whatever ideas he has that he can just run away from it that he can will himself to be uh, faithful and loving and authentic with his wife um, that his identity can sort of be self determined that way changed that way I, I thought was um, I, I thought was a an important part of his life that we were seeing. Um, and now he can't control the negative entity and he's trying to. So the, the, it's almost as if, well, I have a couple things to say about that scene that we just heard, but the negative entity becomes now this, uh, unattainable sort of, um, abstract, uh, unpredictable, but certainly very real visceral thing that Larry can't manage at all. He, he, he even, he tries to form this communication. He tries to set some kind of pattern or deal with, with the entity, but clearly it's almost as if now that he's come to a point where he understands he can't control who he loves, his, his, uh, orientation, his sexuality, this entity almost replaces that sense of um, his need to control something. And I think that you, you point out something that I didn't notice at the time, which is that he, he made a very, I don't know. He made a very bold decision. He's punishing himself. He's um, his body is completely uh, disfigured he is seeing himself as, com as as somebody else. Like I don't, I don't think he he can't ever fly again. His he can't ever be with his family. He looks in the mirror and doesn't know who he sees. I think that this is his way of uh, further punishing himself by rejecting the concept, the idea, the invitation that he can be with with this man that he clearly cares about. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think it's really interesting that he's um, putting all of that. Yet, you know, again, on something that he's, he's unable to overcome. He's, he's, I think that what is going to come next is his, um, his growth is about how to coexist, how to, how to be more accepting of a part of himself. I think the entity is a part of himself. I think it's, I mean, clearly independent because it just makes its own decisions and it's quite mean to him sometimes but metaphorically that could be 
some deep part of ourselves Absolutely. that is mean to mean to ourselves and independent and able to shut us down at any given moment. And uh, similarly, that's the very thing that animates his body. It's the mm-hmm. thing that springs him to life. It's the thing that gives him uh, the ability to wake up every morning. So I mean, we could find that that thing is the soul of Larry. Like that is his, like that right. is Larry in the same way that, uh, that there is something inside of us that animates us and brings us to life. It might simply be that that is now has the ability to be external. Like we don't, yeah. we I don't, mean, we give, don't know. We give it, we, we give it this sense of power in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I, I agree with you. I hadn't thought about this this moment as being uh one in which it's there's a lot of blame where he's yeah. blaming this this entity for something that um that he he can't really take accountability for it's interesting that you bring up the fact that um this entire episode is about control because i you're right in fact there's a moment at the end of the episode as they're all flying back on uh on the the company jet uh, of cyborgs Cyborg does not have the ability to control the situation that they are in because Rita and he are left behind uh, at a little motel after a uh, uh, the bus has broken down because it turns out Rita can't control a bus. She's not a very good driver. She can't control her body. She can't control like her body. Like her entire experience I, I was is getting about there. Yeah. self-control. I was totally getting there. She has not got the ability to control anything about her life and as a result they're st- uh, stranded at this motel um but cyborg is not able to control the situation as best as he would like obviously he wants to take charge he wants to be the hero and he realizes he has very little power and very little control over the situation in fact the one person that recognizes him in the parking lot comes up and asks for a selfie and then asks uh, how Batman is or, you know, what Batman's like. Uh, so, so cyborg, it's, it's interesting earlier in the show, you brought up the idea of celebrity, the idea that these meta powers give these people ce- celebrity status. And we literally see that happen here with cyborg. So he doesn't have the control. Uh, robot man loses control at the end of the episode when, uh, and I would say justifiably so, uh, as a bunch of sort of Nazi clone robot people are, uh, you know, their own puppets, um, are coming to kill him and Jane and, uh, Larry. And, and the, uh, who's the mastermind, what's Von his Fuchs. name again? He is in this. He's in this box. He's, he's almost, basically in a Zoltar. He's, like, he's a Zoltar box. Well, I was going to say he's like palpatine in there. That's going to be the verb or whatever now that this is a little spoiler bit of a spoiler. Yeah, but well, you're not, we already gave people an opportunity to, to he's tuck He's palpatine because but he's not. He's, he's, he's not he like. Ha- he is. He's, he's tubed up and he's. Um, but he is Zoltar. He is in a. He's sentient, but he's also. He can't. He he cannot get out of that box. Right, but he is he is now I, I'm sticking with Zoltar because he's in a wooden box with a glass like he is he is a fortune he's in a fortune telling But you're but it's something that, that is important is that he is controlling the actions of, of the other of all of the other employees yeah. uh the the German employees in the um in the spa. He is all of them. Uh, and so they're all connected to this hive mind. Yes. Uh, and he, Cliff loses control and just destroys them in a very brutal way. Um, so yeah, you're right. This, this episode is entirely about control. And at the end of the episode, when she is in the plane, Jane scrawls on the window uh, a simple phrase, control is a weapon for fascists. Uh, and mm-hmm. we just saw a fascist down in Paraguay use it mm-hmm. on all of these hive-minded uh, cl- clone robot things. Um, and uh, and that is both, you know, it's, it's powerful because it's both... <sighs> From the perspective of a, you know, of course, a sociopolitical 
mm, approach, it's uh, it's true that what is necessary. Uh, and by the way, I wrote a, how how is this connected? I wrote a little bit about this in my essay about Kylo Ren. Uh, I, this concept of um, indoctrination, this uh, and something I asked you about because you knew about this. The the because I've been indoctrinated. No, no, no. The um, indoctrinated uh, into the Nazi youth. Who I was not. I was not. No, I, don't I know, know anything about. I know, but you're well familiar with the history. Uh, and um, Kylo Ren. Let's make something clear. I'm a history buff. I enjoy world history. And you asked me that. It's not because like I. Don't make it sound like I know a whole lot about the Hitler youth. Or the, you know, I am. I, I know. Yes, you asked me the question about them. I I had answers. You know a lot about history in general. Yes, which is is probably true. And uh, although this isn't a podcast about Star Wars, and in, in uh, examining Kylo Ren's um, training, there was a lot of um, seduction, but there was also a lot of. Um, there was a lot of emotional abuse and grooming. Um, so I talked somewhat about grooming in the, throughout sort of the aspects when it's done through this, um, through a set of beliefs, through a set of political and social beliefs. Yeah. And, and that's how, um, that's how Hitler youth were indoctrinated mm -hmm. essentially through these camps. Like this was, this yeah. is what, um, Jojo rabbit. Yeah. What that film's about. Anyhow, what a tangent, but, but, but you're, you're not, you're not off in that the same way that von Fuchs, I mean, yes, they, they are puppets, uh, all of the different entities that, that work for him and that we all think are human, albeit a little weird. Um, they are essentially, um, metaphors for all of those hundreds of thousands of people and millions of people who are indoctrinated through words and through uh, images and through like once you get into their heads, mm -hmm. they then become your puppet. Mm -hmm. You can then control those people to do anything. And I'm not trying to be political on one side or the other. Right. It happens on all sides. The moment you get into their heads, it is as if they are an extension of you. And the moment you are gone, they shut down. And in, this, in that exactly happens in this episode. The moment that they kill Von Fuchs in his machine, every single one of those puppets goes limp. Right. They, they have no mind of their own. Well, and Jane, you know, for me to speak to the psychology of this, since definitely I'm not a historian here, but for Jane then to connect that at the end of the episode is is a way for us to better understand how she's reconciling yeah. all of her alters there's a pressure i think that she might experience to get them in line right mm -hmm. i think some of the other characters cliff especially there's this um uh, almost a um the expectation or this idea that if you just get all your alters to work together, if you actually, if you, if your main persona can control all the other alters, we're not saying, Hey, you've got to make them disappear or combine all of them. But I think there is this pressure that she feels to, um, have a way to manage everybody and I think there's this sort of... Um, and she has spent episodes saying that that's not how she works. Yes. Like she's been trying to tell people that yes. that's not how it works. Yes. And so for her to point out that, you know, control is, is a weapon. And um, and we see then in this episode, especially, we see the negative aspects of that, the deterioration of, the, of, of human um, sensibility and psychology because of... Um, because of that kind of control, I think it gives us somewhat of a better, it gives us insight. It, I, I felt actually kind of sympathetic and even, um, more understanding mm. of Jane's experience. Like her, her concept of herself is to allow them to coexist and to, um, you know, expect that harmony is possible and to understand that they will not. Mm, they will not destroy each other. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and, and this, 
I don't know, this acceptance that she doesn't have to, you know, success for her psychologically be, I'm using air quotes, but being better, having a cure is not necessary. She does not have to get control over all her selves. That is not how she's going to find happiness, success, um, you know, fulfillment. And, and that I think is a really, really nice way to, to wrap this episode up. I, I also felt throughout these last three episodes, Rita has been mm, like struggling with her body. And, um, we learn a little bit about what it takes to control her body. And in the hotel room, while I think it's Cyborg and there's one other character there. I'm trying to remember who else. Well, Rita's in the bathroom. Yeah, they're all trying to get to the bathroom. I think Jane's still there. I think this is when they're yeah, together. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, they're all together. And and so Rita's in the bathroom and she's clearly been there for a long time and uh, people are frustrated with her. There's only one bathroom and she. you would think that it's it goes on the joke of women are in the bathroom significantly longer than they should be. Mm-hmm. But for her, she is literally trying to keep herself together. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of a that's a little bit of a window into eating disorders and you know clearly she is not representing necessarily a particular eating disorder like her her supernatural ability is uh metamorphosis that she she becomes this uh what like 20 times her size and she's this sort of blob sludge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the reason I relate that to eating disorders, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. One is that her entire fixation, her, um, her, uh, her struggle, what she is, um, what she is having the most hardship around is her need to keep her body a certain way. And unfortunately much of the maintenance for that is eating more than she even wants like she has to eat yeah a lot just she, to maintain it's like she has the metabolism like she she that that sludge blob body requires a ton of calories and so she eats a lot but she also um insists on preserving her original Rita body yeah meaning like back from her 40s era films or what have you so um when you see her she is she's uh, screen perfect she looks like a movie star she's absolutely flawless and she tries so hard to to maintain that that uh you know this perfectionism yeah um and so i i think when, when we talk about eating disorders um certainly there is that um the idea and the facts are around like how people do various things, like what, how their behaviors are related to food. So that might include obsessions with food and body weight, obsession or fixation on, on your body's shape. Um, and, and certainly with Rita, there's aspects of that. But what I, I think a lot of times we forget, or people may not even be aware of is that, um, eating disorders are mostly about, control yeah it's mostly you know the disease is mostly around um someone's overwhelming sense of lack of control Mm -hmm. um and how they can use food and weight and shape and exercise and um and unfortunately restriction to gain a sense of um, control and a sense of self-assurance. Uh, it's, it's incredibly pervasive. It's something that's you know, very difficult to live with. Um, and what I like about Rita as a character is that we're seeing, we're seeing some glimpses of this, this, um, very time consuming fixation, this, um, unending incessant and, and even, um, difficult experience that she's having to keep this certain body a certain way. Um, And then like you're saying, then there's this sort of like quirky things that we're also observing. Like she actually overeats and she's, she's got these sort of, she doesn't overeat for her, right? No, no, but she'll have like two chickens in one sitting because that's what she requires. That's what her body requires. And it appears odd to us that there's this sort of quirkiness about it. And if she were that starlet, 
who was starving herself on a set and a movie, she would not be eating that. That would be so uncomfortable for her. But now that is what she requires. Something else yeah. that I think is is interesting um, and something that you were kind of alluding to a moment ago is that when they are all at the manor, I'm sure they all have their own living situations and, and bathrooms. It's a very large house. No one has to deal with her maintenance in the morning to simply be who she is. But now that they're all in one tiny room with mm -hmm. one bathroom, they are now experiencing what she has to go through every single day, potentially, mm -hmm. just to get out of bed, just to come out of the bathroom, just to be downstairs where she can eat two chickens in one sitting and knit as she's watching movies starring herself. This is what Rita has to go through. And they are now experiencing it. Well, and it's a reminder for me that... Uh, uh, people with eating disorders or some a, a good proportion of people with eating disorders may appear healthy and and healthy meaning yeah. like you, you may not notice just by looking at somebody right that um there's um there's a lot of hardship and and that there might be an illness that someone is experiencing there's a certain amount of um i think stereotypes and assumptions that someone's body has to look a certain way emaciated or um or obese in order to have a um, an eating disorder and right. that's that's not true at all um so i think there's you know in this episode there's there are these elements of each character that give us an opportunity to realize like how they're this is it's like a tug of war of control each of them trying to access control or harness control uh, internally. And then this like even broader metaphor of um, social control. Yeah. What, what, what does this, you know, have to do then with um, the meta human, the, the meta human race and this concept of, um, of trying to create um, beings that are superior in some way. Um, and, and the, I think what's lastly, what's really fascinating for me about that is, um, two things, the artificiality of it, because it's, it's just something done in an oven, like there's sort of cooking this in you. Um, and then secondly, um, the, especially for animal, mineral, vegetable, man, um, animal vegetable, animal mineral vegetable. Man. Uh, certainly, um, the grotesque aspect of this, that, um, nothing about this is at least appears, nothing about this appears desirable or wanted Yeah, and how he ended up being super excited to have a second head. That's a dinosaur head. Yeah. Um, but we as observers see this as like just incredibly disturbing. Yeah. One thing that I do want to bring up before we, before we sign off in this episode is Silas Stone, Vic's father. In the last episode, one could come away with thinking that his father may be a little on the, um, uh, I'm not going to say evil side, but, but, but maybe, uh, super controlling, but also um, a little dubious. We we don't know really what side he's on. We don't. He seems very cold toward his son. Uh, he seems very uh, a little bit of an authoritarian. Um, and in this episode, we see that he has cut him off, as if uh, as if uh, as a little bit of an fu because. You asked for independence, so I'm giving it to you. But at the end of this episode, I think it's important to note that when his son really needed him, his, he, he calls up his father and says, I, I seriously, I need help. And his father sends the plane and they go to Paraguay and they're too late to participate in any of the fun. I use fun mm -hmm. in air quotes, but they pick up the rest of the gang and they fly home. 
and they're all tired and they're all worn out as if they were all involved in this because Rita and Cyborg were involved in their own thing. Mm -hmm. And they're all sort of reeling from this. But I think it's important to note that Silas is showing a side of himself that is when my son needs me, he is still my son. He is not my machine. He is not my object with which I fight crime. I will help my son. You saw him as more compassionate. I felt a little, uh, I, I still felt tentative about this. I am, um, I'm uncomfortable with it still. There's but. definitely the there's definitely the air of, haha, you do need me. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that's any different than what any parent would put their teenage kid through when their teenage kid sure. decided that they didn't need their family anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but really, when it came down, you know, when it came down to it, I'm still going to give you what you need. I'm still going to provide for you. I'm still going to help you where I can, uh, short of showing up and fighting crime myself. I'm, I'm going to do it. And he did. And, and I appreciated that. Now, where it goes from here, mm -hmm. who knows? We shall see. We'll see. We will see starting in two weeks with a brand new episode. Um, until then, Daria, what, what did you think of this episode? Like, you know, when you, when you really think back, what were your what were your thoughts and feelings? I think once I, I was able to connect a a common this golden thread here, this idea that um, an amount of control is really important for us, that as human beings we seek it, we we are healthy because of how you know because of our ability to be self-determined and to have will, uh, free will, all that stuff. Um, but then also the chains of not having control. Um, the, the suffering that can happen because of that, um, even to the extent of, uh, you, you know, this, this concept of, um, parental control, right? This, this concept that you bring up at the end. So I think overall, I really enjoyed it. And you know me, if I can find this theme to it, then I'm able to connect to it. So what you're saying is more. if you can control your viewing yes. of it. Yes. Yes. You enjoy it more. Then I experience joy. And I think our listeners enjoy listening to you control your viewing experience of it and everything you can pull from it. I think it's all valuable stuff. And I can't wait to talk about it next time. Until then, why don't you tell the folks where they can find you online? I am on Twitter at Arkham Asylum Doc, on Instagram, Arkham Asylum Doc, and on LinkedIn, Andrea Letamendi. Uh, LinkedIn. Is that, is that LinkedIn? At, at LinkedIn. Is that yeah. LinkedIn? I don't. Wherever, sure. wherever you can. Uh, and and it, I always say this, LinkedIn is both the place where um, I have some of my most interesting and helpful interactions, some of the most views. You don't interact with me at all uh, well, on was, LinkedIn. And, but LinkedIn is also the most toxic for me. Why? I don't. That's where some trolls come and At just LinkedIn? attack me. Yes. Really? Yes. It is so. My experience there is so weird. I have never ever heard. I you know Twitter trolls, Facebook trolls. I have never ever heard of anyone going to a professional business website to uh, like social media platform to to troll. That is incredible. We got to dive into this at some point. Um, you can find me. I am on Twitter at B ward zero two eight. You can find me on Instagram at B underscore ward zero two eight. You can find us both on Twitter at Arkham sessions. Instagram's the same. You can also come find us on Facebook and interact with us there. And as I mentioned at the head of the show, go to tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash the dash Arkham dash sessions to get your Arkham sessions, merch, t-shirts, stickers, no binders. I still don't think they have slap bracelets, Drea, but, uh, but you go find what you want there, order it. And, um, it helps us out a little bit until next time. I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Drea Latamendi. And together we are the Arkham sessions.
Consultants are standing by to assist you. Sadly, we no longer accept Groupons.